Good day one and all, and to one and all a good day. My name is Speedy, also known as Lewis, welcoming you to episode 8 of the Speedy Stuff podcast. Now, before we get on with the podcast itself, uh, I would like to apologise on behalf of both Terrier Productions and Mark 5 Productions as to just how behind schedule episode 7 of the podcast was. It was nearly a week and a half behind schedule. I apologise profusely for that, but as of this Friday coming, the 17th of November, uh, I will try to upload episodes of the podcast on a fortnightly basis. Um, in relation, actually, to the next three episodes of the podcast, so that includes this episode and the next two episodes, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different, something that I've never really done before. I've entertained the idea plenty of times prior to now, but I've never put the idea into practice. Until now. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be reading a series of stories. Uh, nothing overly special, just a couple of volumes of the Railway series by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey and his son Christopher Audrey. Now, for those of you who may or may not know, the Railway series was a series of books that was written by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey, and in the early 1980s, a lady called Britt Allcroft came along, got in touch with the Reverend and said, I want to turn these books into a television show. They got Ringo Starr on board as the narrator, and the, uh, well, the, um, <laughs> how can I phrase this? Uh, let's see, uh, the, 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 the illegitimate love child of this contractual three-way was the television show Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. But for this episode and episode nine, I... As I said, I'm going to be reading five stories from the original Railway Series book series. Today's episode will include the Railway Series Volume 10 for Little Engines, the Railway Series Volume 14, The Little Old Engine, and the first two stories from the Railway Series Volume 25, Duke the Lost Engine. Pardon me. So, um... That's pretty much it. I will now take this opportunity to say uh, thank you all very, very much for listening. I'm going to say that in advance. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy this. So, here we go, starting with the Railway Series Volume 10, Four Little Engines. Four Little Engines by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey. The Reverend Wilbert Audrey introduces four new engines. All are small engines running on their own special line, and they are looked after by the Thin Controller. Forward. Dear friends, Sir Handel Brown is the owner of a little railway which goes to Scarlowy and Reneus. Scarloe means lake in the woods, and Reneus means divided waterfall. They are beautiful places, and lots of people visit them. The owner is very busy, so Mr. Peter Sam, the thin controller, manages the railway. The two engines, who are called Scarloe and Reneus, grew old and tired, so the owner bought two others. The stories tell you what happened. Signed, the author. The Railway Series Volume 10, Four Little Engines by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey. Story 1 of 4, Scarlowy Remembers. The fat controller had sent Edward to the works to be mended. Near the works station, Edward noticed a narrow gauge engine standing in an open sided shed. That's Scarlowy, he thought. What's he doing there? He remembered Scarlowy and his brother Aeneas, because in the old days he had often brought passengers who wanted to travel up to the lake in their little train. As the men at the works couldn't mend him at once, Edward asked them to put him on a siding close to Scarlowy. Scarlowy was pleased to see Edward. 
The owner has just bought two more engines, he said. He told me I was a very old engine and deserved a good rest. He gave me this shed so that I could see everything and not be lonely. But I am lonely all the same, he continued sadly. I miss Reneus very much. Yesterday one of the new engines pushed him onto a truck and now he's gone to be mended. I wish I could be mended too and pull coaches again. Have your coaches got names? asked Edward. Oh yes, there's Angus, Ruth, Jemima, Lucy and Beatrice. Agnes is proud. She has cushions for first class passengers. She pities Ruth, Jemima and Lucy, who are third class with bare boards, but they all four sniff at Beatrice. Beatrice often smells of fish and cheese, but she is most important, said Scarlow earnestly. She has a little window through which the guard sells tickets. I sometimes leave the others behind, but I always take Beatrice. You must have tickets and a guard, you know. Of course, said Edward gravely. Linnaeus and I, continued Scullery, used to take turns at pulling the trains. We know everybody, and everybody knows us. We whistle to the people in the fields, at level crossings, and in lonely cottages and farms, and the people always wave to us. We love passing the school playgrounds at break time, for then the children will always run over to the fence to watch us go by. The passengers always wave, because they think the children are waving to them. But we engines know better, of course, said Scarlowy importantly. Yes, we do indeed, agreed Edward. We take your tourists to the lake and then get ready to pull the train back. We enjoy the morning journey home because then our friends from the villages come down to do their shopping. We whistle before every station. Peep, peep, look out, and the people are there ready. Where's Mrs. Last? asks the guard. She's coming. Peep, peep, we whistle, and Mrs. Last comes running onto the platform. We'll leave you behind one of these days, Mrs. laughs our driver, but we know he never will. We stop elsewhere too, at farm crossings and stiles, where paths lead to lonely houses. Reneus and I know all the places very well indeed, and our driver used to say we would stop even if he didn't put on the brakes. Sometimes, on market day, Ruth, Jemima and Lucy were so full of passengers that the guard would allow third-class passengers to travel in Agnes. She didn't like that at all, and would grumble. First class coach, third class people. That made me cross. Shut up, I said, or I'll bump you. That soon stopped her rudeness to my friends. Just then the workmen came. We're going to mend you now, Edward, they said. Come along. Goodbye, Scarlery. Thank you for telling me about your railway. It's a lovely little line. It is. It is. Thank you for talking to me, Edward. You've cheered me up. Goodbye. Scarlery watched Edward being taken back to the works. Then, shutting his eyes, he dozed in the warm afternoon sun. He smiled as he dozed, for he was dreaming, as old engines will, of happy days in the past. The Railway Series Volume 10 Four Little Engines by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 2 of 4 Sir Handel The new engines looked very smart. One was called Sir Handel, and the other Peter Sam. What a small shed, grumbled Sir Handel. This won't do at all. I think it's nice, said Peter Sam. Ha, <laughs> grunted Sir Handel. What's that rubbish? Shh, said Peter Sam. That's Scar the famous old engine. 
I'm sorry, Scarlowy, he whispered. Sir Handel's upset now, but he's quite nice, really. Scarlowy felt sorry for Peter Sam. Now, Sir Handel, said the fireman next morning, we'll get you ready. I'm tired, he yawned. Let Peter Sam go, he'd love it. No, said the fireman. Owner's orders, you're first. Oh well, said Sir Handel sulkily. I suppose if I must. When his driver arrived, Sir Handel puffed away to fetch the coaches. Whatever next, he snorted. Those aren't coaches, they're cattle trucks. Oh, screamed Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima and Beatrice. What a horrid engine! It's just not what I'm used to, clanked Sir Handel rebelliously, making for the station. He rolled to the platform just as Gordon arrived. Hello, he said. Who are you? I'm Gordon. Who are you? I'm Sir Handel. Yes, I've heard of you. You're an express engine, I believe. So am I, but I'm used to bogey coaches, not these cattle trucks. Do you have bogey coaches? Oh uh, yes, I see you do. We must have a chat sometime. Sorry I can't stop, must keep to time, you know. And he puffed off, leaving Gordon at a loss for words. Come along, come along, he puffed. Cattle trucks, cattle trucks, grumbled the coaches. We'll pay him out, we'll pay him out. Presently they stopped at a station. The line curved here and began to climb. It wasn't very steep, but the day was misty and the rails were slippery. Hold back, whispered Angus to Ruth. Hold back, whispered Ruth to Jemima. Hold back, whispered Jemima to Lucy. Hold back, whispered Lucy to Beatrice, and they giggled as Sir Handel started and their couplings tightened. Come on, come on, he puffed as his wheels slipped on the greasy rails. Come on, come on, come on, come on! His wheels were spinning, but the coaches pulled him back, and the train stopped on the hill beyond the station. I can't do it! I can't do it! he grumbled. I'm used to sensible bogey coaches, not these bumpy cattle trucks! The guard came up. I think the coaches are up to something, he told the driver. So they decided to bring the train down again to a level piece of line to give Sir Handel a good start. The guard helped the fireman put sand on the rails and Sir Handel made a tremendous effort. The coaches tried hard to drag him back, but he puffed and pulled so hard that they were soon over the top and away on their journey. The thin controller was severe with Sir Handel that night. You are a troublesome engine, he said. You are rude, conceited, and much too big for your wheels. Next time I shall punish you severely. Sir Handel was impressed and behaved for several days. Then one morning he took the train to the top station. He was cross. It was Peter Sam's turn, but the thin controller had made him go instead. We'll leave the coaches said his driver, and fetch some trucks from the quarry. Trucks! snorted Sir Handel. Trucks! Yes, his driver replied. Trucks! Sir Handel jerked forward. I won't, he muttered. So there! He lurched, bumped, and stopped. His driver and fireman got out. Told you, said Sir Handel triumphantly. He had pushed the rails apart and settled down between them. They telephoned the thin controller. He came up at once with Peter Sam and brought some workmen in a truck. Then he and the fireman took Peter Sam home with the coaches, while the driver and workmen put Sir Handel back on the rails. Sir Handel didn't feel so pleased with himself when he crawled home and found the thin controller waiting for him. You are a very naughty engine, he said sternly. 
You will stay in the shed till I can trust you to behave. The Railway Series Volume 10 Four Little Engines by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 3 of 4 Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady As Sir Handel was shut up, Peter Sam had to run the line. He was excited, and the fireman found it hard to get him ready. Sober up, can't you? he growled. Anybody would think, said Sir Handel rudely, that he wanted to work. All respectable engines do, said Scarlowy firmly. I wish I could myself. Keep calm, Peter Sam. Don't get excited, and you'll do very well. Peter Sam was in such a state that he couldn't listen. When his driver came, Peter Sam ran along to fetch the coaches. Beep, 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 beep. Come along, girls, he whistled, and although he was excited, he remembered to be careful. That's the way my dears gently does it. What did he say? asked Jemima, who was deaf. He said, come along, girls, and he, he called us his dears simpered the other coaches. Really, one does not know what to think. Such a handsome young engine, too. So nice and well-mannered. And they tittered happily together as they followed Peter Sam. Peter Sam fussed into the station to find Henry already there. This won't do, youngster, he said. I can't be kept waiting. If you're late tonight, I'll go off and leave your coaches behind. Puh, said Peter Sam, but secretly he was a little worried. But he couldn't feel worried for long. What fun it all is, he thought as he ran round his train. He let off steam happily while he waited for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. Peter Sam puffed happily away singing a little song. I'm Peter Sam, I'm running this line. I'm Peter Sam, I'm running this line. The people waved as he passed the farms and cottages, and he gave a loud whistle at the school. The children all came to see him puffing pie. Agnes, Ruth, Jemima, Lucy, and Beatrice enjoyed themselves too. He's cocky, truck, truck. But he's nice, truck, truck. He's cocky, truck, truck. But he's nice, truck, truck. They sang as they trundled along. They were growing very fond of Peter Sam. Every afternoon, they had to wait an hour at the lake. The driver, the fireman, and the guard usually bought something from the refreshment lady and went and sat in Beatrice. The refreshment lady always came home on this train. Time passed slowly for Peter Sam today. At last, his driver and fireman came. Peep, peep! Hurry up, please! He whistled to the passengers, and they came strolling back to the station. Peter Sam was sizzling with impatience. How awful, he thought if we miss Henry's train. The last passengers arrived. The guard was ready with his green flag and whistle. The refreshment lady walked across the platform. Then it happened. The guard says that Peter Sam was too impatient. Peter Sam says he was sure he heard a whistle. Anyway, he started. Come quickly, come quickly, he puffed. Stop, 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 wailed the coaches. You've left her behind. You've left her behind. The guard whistled and waved his red flag. The driver, looking back, saw the refreshment lady shouting and running after the train. Bother, groaned Peter Sam as he stopped. We'll miss Henry now. The refreshment lady climbed into Beatrice, and they started again. 
We are sure to be late. We are sure to be late, panted Peter Sam frantically. His driver had to keep checking him. Steady, old boy, steady. Peep, peep, Peter Sam whistled at the stations. Hurry, please hurry. And they reached the big station just as Henry steamed in. Hurrah, said Peter Sam. We've caught him after all. And he let off steam with relief. Whoosh! Not bad, youngster, said Henry loftily. The refreshment lady shook her fist at Peter Sam. What do you mean by leaving me behind? she demanded. I'm sorry, refreshment lady, but I was worried about our passengers. And he told her what Henry had said. The refreshment lady laughed. You silly engine! she said. Henry wouldn't dare go. He's got to wait. It's a guaranteed connection. Well, said Peter Sam. Well, where's that Henry? But Peter Sam was too late that time, for Henry had chortled away. The Railway Series Volume 10 Four Little Engines by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 4 of 4 Old Faithful Sir Handel stayed shut up for several days, but one market day Peter Sam couldn't work. He needed repairs. Sir Handel was glad to come out. He tried to be kind, but the coaches didn't trust him. They were awkward and rude. He even sang them little songs, but it was no use. It was more unfortunate, too, that Sir Handel had to check suddenly to avoid running over a sheep. He's bumped us, screamed the coaches. Let's pay him out! The coaches knew that all engines must go carefully at a place near the big station, but they were so cross with Sir Handel that they didn't care what they did. They surged into Sir Handel, making him lurch off the line. Luckily, no one was hurt. Sir Handel limped into the shed. The thin controller inspected the damage. No more work for you today, he said. Bother those coaches. We must take the village people home and fetch the tourists, all without an engine. What about me, sir? said a voice. Scarlowey! he exclaimed. Can you do it? I'll try answered the old engine. The coaches stood at the platform. Scarlowy advanced on them, hissing crossly. I'm ashamed of you, he scolded. Such behaviour, you might have hurt our passengers. On market day too. We're sorry, Scarlowy. We didn't think. It's that Sir Handel. He's no tails, said Scarlowy firmly. I won't have it, and don't you dare try tricks on me. Oh, no, Scarlery, of course not Scarlery, quavered the coaches meekly. Scarlery might be old and have dirty paint, but he was certainly an engine who would stand no nonsense. His friends crowded round, and the guard had to shoo them away before they could start. Scarlery felt happy. He remembered all the gates and stiles where he had to stop, and whistled to his friends. The sun shone, and the rails were dry. This is lovely, he thought. But presently they began to climb, and he felt short of steam. Bother my tubes, he panted. Take your time, old boy, soothed his driver. I'll manage, I'll manage he wheezed, and, pausing for breath at the stations, he gallantly struggled along. After a rest at the top station, Scarlowy was ready to start. It'll be better downhill, he thought. The coaches ran nicely, but he soon began to feel tired again. His springs were weak, and the rail joints jarred his wheels. With a crack, a front spring broke, and he stopped. I feel all crooked, 
he complained. That's torn it, said his driver. We'll need a bus now for our passengers. No, pleaded Scarlowy. I'd be ashamed to have a bus take my passengers. I'll get home or burst, he promised bravely. The Finn controller looked at his watch and paced the platform. James and his train waited impatiently too. They heard a horse, peep, peep, then groaning, clanging and clanking, Scarlowy crept into sight. He was tilted to one side and making fearful noises, but he plodded bravely on. I'll do it, I'll do it, he gasped between the clanks and groans. I'll, I've done it and he sighed thankfully as his train stopped where James was waiting. James said nothing. He waited for his passengers and then respectively puffed away. You were right, sir, said Scarlowy to the owner that evening. Old engines can't pull trains like young ones. The owner smiled. They can if they're mended, old faithful he said, and that's what will happen to you. You deserve it. Oh, sir, said Scarlowy happily. Sir Handel is longing for Scarlowy to come back. He thinks that Scarlowy is the best engine in the world. He does his fair share of the work now, and the coaches never play tricks on him, because he always manages them in Scarlowy's way. The Railway Series Volume 14 The Little Old Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey This book tells of what happened when Scarlowy came home after being mended. You will remember from Four Little Engines that Sir Handel Brown, the owner, had sent him away. Scarlowy isn't real, but there is a real engine just like Scarlowy. He is very, very old and has been mended. His name is Talachin and he lives at Towing in Wales. Forward. Dear friends, you remember in Four Little Engines that Sir Handel Brown, the owner, sent Scarlowy away to be mended. These stories tell you what happened when the little old engine came home. Scarlowy isn't real, but you can see him in these books. But there is a real engine just like Scarlowy. He is very, very old and has been mended. His name is Talachin, and he lives at Towing in Wales. You would all enjoy going to see him at work. Signed, the author. The Railway Series Volume 14 the Little Old Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 1 of 4 Trucks Sir Handel and Peter Sam had hard work while Scarlowy was away. The owner gave them buffers and even bought a diesel named Rusty, but Sir Handel grumbled continually. One day Gordon saw him shunting and laughed. My controller makes me shunt. Sir Handel said sheepishly, and take trucks to quarries too. I'm highly sprung, and I suffer dreadfully. Our controllers don't understand our feelings, sympathised Gordon. Now, if you were ill, he winked, you couldn't go, could you? Good idea, said Sir Handel. I'll try that. I don't feel well, he groaned the next morning. There wasn't time to examine him then, so some of the trucks were coupled behind Peter Sam's coaches, and Rusty promised to follow with the rest. He he he, sniggered Sir Handel, but no one noticed. They were all too busy. Peter Sam didn't mind the extra work. He left his coaches at the top station and trundled cheerfully through the woods. The trucks clattered behind him in an agitated way but he paid no attention. It might have been better if he had. 
Sleet comes from quarries high up in the hills. That travels down in trucks on a steep railway called an incline. Empty trucks at the bottom are hitched to a rope. Loaded ones at the top are hitched to another one. By their weight, loaded trucks run down the incline, pulling up the empties. There are strong brakes in the winding house at the top to prevent loaded trucks from running down too fast. The ropes are very strong too, but in spite of this, trucks sometimes play dangerous tricks. Peter Sam never bumped trucks unless they misbehaved. Sir Handel bumped them even if they were good, so they didn't like him and played tricks whenever they could. Peter Sam pushed the empty trucks to a siding, where his fireman hitched them to the rope. Then, on another siding, he pulled back some loaded trucks. With these in front of him, he stood waiting. More loaded trucks stood at the top of the incline, ready to come down. They couldn't see Peter Sam. They thought he was Sir Handel and wanted to pay him out. They began to move. Faster! Faster! They grumbled. They reached halfway, gathering speed. Scrag him! Scrag him! They yelled. No, no! Wailed the empty trucks. It's Peter Sam! It's Peter Sam! But it was no use. The loaded trucks were straining at the rope. They broke it with a crack. Hurrah! Hurrah! They roared, hurtling down the hill. Peter Sam heard them. He shut his eyes. His driver and fireman crouched in his cab. The crash jerked him violently backwards. Ouch! He shivered. I didn't expect a cold bath. The water poured from a channel smashed by flying slates. He was soaked from funnel to cab. Peep, peep, he spluttered and was glad when he heard Rusty's answering, Toot! Well, bust my buffers, exclaimed Rusty. What a mess! Never mind, Peter Sam, we'll get you out. He soon pulled him away from the water and the trucks. Peter Sam felt battered. His funnel was cracked and his boiler dented, but he was glad his driver and fireman were unhurt. He thanked Rusty and limped slowly home. Rusty stayed to help clear the wreckage. I'm sorry about your accident, Peter Sam, said Sir Handel. I always stand well back. Trucks don't like me, you see. Why didn't you warn me? I didn't think. You never do, said a stern voice. You could start now while you're doing Peter Sam's work as well as your own. That'll teach you to pretend you're ill. Sir Handel did start thinking. He thought about thin controllers, and he thought about Gordon. He wanted to give Gordon a piece of his mind. The Railway Series Volume 14 The Little Old Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 2 of 4 Home at Last Peter Sam wanted to start work, but the thin controller wouldn't let him. Another day's rest will do you good, he said. Besides, I've got a surprise for you. For me, sir? How nice, sir. What is it, sir? Wait and see, smiled the thin controller. The surprise was Scar Louie. Oh, said Peter Sam, I'm glad you've come home. They lit Scarlowy's fire, and he sizzled happily. I feel all excited, he said, just like a young engine. I'm longing to pull my dear old coaches again. Are they running nicely? Yes, they're running well, Peter Sam answered, but we have five other coaches now. Scarlowy was interested. Oh, he said, tell me about them. Cora is a guards fan. She isn't as big as Beatrice, and she hasn't a ticket window, but I like her best. She was my guards fan in the old days. Ada, Jane and Mabel are plain. They have no roofs. 
So Handel says they are trucks, but they have seats, said Peter Sam. So I see they're coaches. What do you think, Scarlowy? The old engine smiled. If they have seats, they're coaches, he said firmly. Sir Handel likes Gertrude and Millicent best, Peter Sam went on. He always tries to take them alone. They have bogies, and he says they're the only real coaches we have. They remind him of when he used to pull our express. Both have seats for passengers, but Millicent has a guard as well. He sells tickets and travels in a tiny cupboard place. I don't like that, he remarked earnestly. Guards are very important. They need fans. They shouldn't be put into cupboards. Scarlowy said nothing, so Peter Sam continued. Did Rusty help you off your truck? Yes, he says he's come to mend the line and do odd jobs. I like him, smiled Scarlowy. So do I, Peter Sam explained how kind Rusty was when he had his accident. It's a pity Duncan doesn't like him. Who is Duncan? He came as a spare engine after my accident. Is he useful? He'll pull anything, and I'm sure he means well, but he's bouncy and rude. He used to work in a factory, and his language is often strong. I understand, said Scarlowy bravely. Just then the telephone rang, and Scarlowy's driver and fireman climbed into his cab. Come on, old boy, they said. Duncan is stuck in the tunnel, and we'll have to get him out. Scarlowy was pleased. He wanted to run and looked forward to meeting Duncan. They found Cora and some workmen and hurried up the line. How nice and smooth the rails are, thought Scarlowy. They've mended all the old bumps. Rusty has helped to do that. I must tell him how nice it is. Duncan had stuck at the far end of the tunnel. His coaches were outside, and the passengers were helping the driver and fireman to dislodge some rocks wedged between the top of his cab and the tunnel roof. Duncan was cross. I'm a plain blunt engine, he kept saying. I speak as I find. Tunnels that should be tunnels are not rabbit holes. This railway is no good at all. Don't be silly, snapped his driver. This tunnel is quite big enough for engines who don't want to rock and roll. They cleared away the rocks and Scarlowy pulled Duncan and his coaches safely through. Cora was left on a siding and the workmen stayed to make sure all was safe. Duncan grumbled all the way home, but Scarlowy paid no attention. The thin controller was waiting for them. You listen to me, Duncan, he said. There is nothing wrong with that tunnel. You stuck because you tried to do rock and roll. If it happens again, I'll cut down your cab and your funnel too. Duncan, ashamed, was neither plain nor blunt for a whole evening. The Railway Series Volume 14 The Little Old Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story three of four, Rock and Roll. When Scarlowy's turn came, he was glad to take out the coaches and meet old friends. He met Rusty up the line. You know, he said, if I couldn't see the old places, I'd think I was on a different railway. Rusty laughed. We hoped you would. Mr. Hugh, our foreman, said, Rusty, Scarlowy's coming home. Let's mend the track so well that he won't know where he is. And we did. And you didn't, if you take my meaning. Scarlowy chuckled away. He liked this hard-working, friendly little engine. There's still one bad bit, said Rusty anxiously that evening. It's just before the first station. We hadn't time. Never mind, said Scarlowy. It's much better now than it was. Maybe better. 
but it's not good, replied Rusty. An engine might come off there. Peter, Sam and Sir Handel take time, and so do you, but I'm worried about Duncan. He will do rock and roll. I shouldn't like his passengers hurt. What about me? I'm a plain engine, and I believe in plain speaking. Speak up, and stop whispering in the corners. Rusty told Duncan about the bad bit of line, and warned him to be careful. Huh, <laughs> he grunted. I know my way about, thank you. I don't need smelly diesels to tell me what to do. Rusty looked hurt. Never mind, said Scarlowy. You've done your best. He said no more, but he thought a great deal. The next morning, Rusty left Duncan to find his own coaches. Duncan snorted and banged about the yard, then clattered crossly to the station. James was already there. You're late, he snapped. I know, said Duncan. It's that smelly Diesel's fault. He thinks he can teach me how to stay off the rails, and then goes off to leave me to find my own coaches. You poor engine, sympathised James. I know all about Diesel's. One crept into our yard and ordered us about. I soon sent him packing. Duncan gazed at him admiringly. He didn't know that James was boastful, and sometimes didn't tell the truth. Send him packing, send him packing, snorted Duncan. He climbed the first hill furiously. Well done, boy, keep it up, encouraged his driver. They were soon near the first station. Duncan was pleased. Nothing's happened, nothing's happened, he chortled. Silly old Diesel, clever me. And he swaggered along doing his rock and roll. Steady, boy! His driver tried to check him, but too late. There was a tearing, cracking, crunching sound, and Duncan stopped bumpily. Sleepers and ballast! he exclaimed. I'm off. And he was. I warned him, said Rusty crossly. Duncan, I said, you be careful on that bit of line. But all he did was call me names. Mr. Hugh kept turning Rusty's handle. Oh, come on, he urged. Start up. No, Mr. Hugh, sir. I'm sorry to disoblige, but I won't help that Duncan. I'm ashamed of you, Rusty said Scarlowy severely. Think of the passengers. What are they going to do? Oh, said Rusty. I'd forgotten them. I'm sorry, Mr. Hugh, sir. We must help the passengers. And his engine roared into life. Oh, dear, thought Duncan. Now everyone will know how silly I am. Presently, Mr. Hugh and Rusty brought sleepers and old rails. Mr. Hugh showed the passengers how to use them, and they soon levered Duncan back to the line. Duncan was extra careful all day. Rusty, he whispered that night. Thank you for helping. I'm sorry I was rude. That's all right. I wish all diesels were like you. Eh, hey, let's be friends. Suits me, said Rusty. We'll mend that bad bit first thing tomorrow. The Railway Series Volume 14, The Little Old Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey. Story 4 of 4, Little Old Twins. One day, the owner brought some people to see the railway. He showed them everything. They travelled in the trains, and looked at stations, and bridges, and coaches. Yes, they would say thoughtfully. We'll take this. Or, no, we won't take that. They made notes in their books. Peter Sam whispered to Sir Handel. Men came and did that on our old line. And then, said Sir Handel, soon afterwards it was... It was... Sold! 
finished Peter Sam mournfully. Peter Sam didn't sing any more. He wanted to cry. The other engines were sad too. What's the matter with you all? His driver asked him one day. You all look like dying ducks. We don't want to be sold, said Peter Sam miserably. Sold? The driver was surprised. Who to? To those people who came and talked about taking things. You silly little engine, laughed his driver. They're not going to buy us. They're going to take our pictures on television. And he tried to explain what that meant. Not going to be sold, not going to be sold, sang Peter Sam. He could hardly wait to tell the others. He told them about the television as well, and they were pleased and excited too. All except Sir Handel. I don't hold with it, he grumbled. Vulgar, I call it. Fancy traipsing about making an exhibition of yourselves. I won't do it, I tell you. Tell you something indeed. Just let the thing controller come here. I'll tell him something. Scarlowy said nothing. He just winked at Peter Sam. But the next day, when the thin controller did explain about the television, Sir Handel kept strangely quiet. No, said the thin controller at last. I want every engine to take part. I d d don't feel well, quavered Sir Handel. You poor engine, said the thin controller gravely. You can stay in the shed. Sir Handel beamed broadly. And your driver and fireman shall take you to pieces. That will make a very interesting picture. Just what we need. Sir Handel's feelings were beyond words. That's that, said the thin controller. Now, Scarlowy, will you be taking Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima and Beatrice? Yes, please, sir. I was hoping you would let me have them. Duncan shall have a good strain, while Rusty, with Mr. Hugh and the men, can show how we mend the line. Please, sir, what about me, sir? asked Peter Sam anxiously. The thin controller smiled. You, Peter Sam, shall pull the special television train. Oh, sir! Oh, sir! bubbled Peter Sam in ecstasy. The television men built towers for cameras beside the line. They put cameras on Ada too and filled Gertrude with wires and instruments. Some trucks, coupled behind, carried aerials and generators. Everyone practised hard till they knew just what they had to do. At last the time came and the announcer gave the signal. We are on the air! We are on the air! We are on the air, puffed Peter Sam, and he rolled the heavy train to the shops, where Sir Handel was being mended. Sir Handel did not enjoy their visit. We are on the air! We are on the air! chanted Peter Sam. He trundled over the bridge near the middle station. Beep, beep, he whistled to Duncan. We are coming! The announcer talked to Duncan, and then they puffed over the second bridge to Quarry Siding, where Rusty, Mr. Hugh, and the men were waiting to explain about their work. Soon, they had to go. Peter Sam whistled, Rusty tooted in reply, and they clattered through the tunnel, rumbled over the viaduct near the waterfall, and rolled at last into the top station. The owner climbed down. We arranged for television, he said, to let everyone see our little old engine. We are proud of him. Ninety-five years old and good as new. There's nothing like him anywhere. Three cheers for Scar Louie. Peep, 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 whistled Peter Sam, and everybody joined in. Scar Louie smiled. I'm very glad to be home again. Thank you, sir, and all, for your nice surprise. And now, 
I'll surprise you. Listen, when I was mended in England, I found my twin. The owner stared. Is there really another engine like you? Yes, sir, chuckled Scarlowy. There is. Another engine came to be mended too, called Talachin. When the workmen saw us together, they laughed and called us their little old twins. Talachin told me about his railway. It's a lovely one at Towin in Wales. Well, sir, they mended us both and sent us home. But I often think of Talachin. He's ninety-five year old too, just like me. Please go and see him, all of you, and wish him dry rails and good running from Scar Louis, his little old twin. The Railway Series Volume 25 Duke the Lost Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Introducing an engine called Duke who was lost in his own shed for 22 years because of a landslide. He looks like a real engine called Prince, which runs a pod Madog in Wales. Forward. Dear friends, an engine lost in the South American jungle was found after 30 years. A tree had grown through its chimney and hornets nested in its firebox. When mended, it gave good service for 30 more years. The Duke was lost too. Not in the jungle, but in his own shed, which our landslide had buried. Not long ago, he was dug out and mended. His own railway had been pulled up, so he is now at the Thin Controllers. Signed, The Author. The Railway Series Volume 25 Duke the Lost Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 1 of 4 Grandpuff Once upon a time, three little engines lived in their own little shed on their own little railway. Duke was brown, Falcon blue, and Stuart green. Duke was the oldest. He had been the first engine on the line and named after the Duke of Sodor. He was proud of this and wanted everything just so. Whenever the others did anything they shouldn't, he would say, That would never suit his grace. Other engines came and went, but Duke outlasted them all. Stuart and Falcon used to call him Grandpuff. Duke was fond of them, and tried to keep them in order. They were fond of him too, as he was so wise and kind, but they did get tired of hearing about his grace. Sometimes they would wink at each other, and chant solemnly, Engines come and engines go, Grand Puff goes on forever. You impudent scallywags, Duke would say indignantly, whatever are young engines coming to nowadays? Never mind, Grand Puff, we are only young once. Well, you'd better mind, unless you want to end up like number two. Oh, Grand Puff, what's ever happened? Number two, said Duke, was American and very cocky. He rode roughly and often came off the rails. I warned him to be careful. Listen, bud, he drawled. In the States, we don't care a dime for a few spells. We do here, I said, but he just laughed. But he didn't laugh when the manager took away his wheels and said he was going to make him useful at last. But why? What did he do? He turned him into a pumping engine. That's what. He's still there, behind our shed. Stuart and Falcon were unusually good for several days. Stuart and Falcon became useful engines, and all three were happy together for many years. But hard times came. The mines closed one by one, and the engines had little to do. 
At last, their line was closed, and people came to buy the engines. We'll take Stuart and Falcon, they said, but no one wanted Duke. They thought him too old. Cheer up, Grandpuff, called Stuart as they went away. We'll find a nice railway, and then you can come and keep us in order. They all laughed bravely, but not one of them thought it would ever come true. Duke's driver and fireman oiled and greased him. They sheeted him snugly and said goodbye. They had to go away and find work. Duke was alone, locked up in his shed. Where's his grace? he wondered. It's not like him to forget me. But his grace had been killed in the war, and the new Duke, a boy, hadn't heard of his little engine. Oh well, said Duke to himself. I'll go to sleep. It'll help pass the time. Years passed. Winter torrents washed soil from the hills over the shed. Trees and bushes grew around. You wouldn't have known there was a shed there, let alone a little engine asleep inside it. Have you guessed about Stuart and Falcon? Yes. You're quite right. They came to the Thin Controller's Railway. He gave them new coats and new names. Stuart became Peter Sam, and Falcon Sir Handel. They prefer their new names. That was a long time ago, but they never forgot Grandpa, and often talked about him when alone. They were excited to hear that the Duke was coming to Scarlowy and Renes's 100th birthday, but most disappointed with the duke who actually came, for he was only a man. But we mustn't say no more, or we'll spoil the next story. The Railway Series Volume 25 Duke the Lost Engine by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey Story 2 of 4 Bulldog Ever since Scarlowy and Reneus had their 100th birthday, Peter Sam had been worried. He kept on saying that the real Duke never came. Rubbish, said Duncan. Of course he was real. All the same, Peter Sam persisted. He wasn't our Duke. Our Duke, said Sir Handel, is an engine. You're as bad as he is. All engine dukes were scrapped. Ask Duck. Duck doesn't know everything, Scarlowy put in quietly. Tell us about him, you two. Here is one of the stories that Peter Sam and Sir Handel told about Grandpuff. It happened when Sir Handel was new to the line. Now, have you remembered that in those days he was called Falcon and painted blue? You have? Now we can begin. The manager came to see him one day and said he was pleased with his work so far. Now, Falcon, he went on, you must learn the mountain road. Yes, please, sir, said Falcon, excited. So tomorrow you shall go double-heading on it with Duke. He'll explain everything. Falcon didn't like this. He thought Duke was a fusspot and a regular old fuddy-duddy. Duke's train was one for holidaymakers. He called it the Picnic. Falcon was ready when Duke arrived. Duke drew forwards beside him. Listen, he said, the mountain road is difficult. You take the train and I'll couple in front. No, said Falcon. Are you lead? How can I learn the road with you lumbering ahead, blocking the view? Suit yourself, said Duke shortly, but never mind the view. Attend to the track. Look at the track, he puffed again on starting. Never mind the view. Fusspot, fusspot, puffed Falcon on starting. Fuddy duddy, fuddy duddy, fuddy duddy. They rattled through the first tunnel, looped around, recrossed the river and entered the second, 
climbing all the time. Their speed grew slower and slower. Don't dawdle, don't dawdle, urged Falcon. No hurry, no hurry, puffed Duke stultily. The tunnel was curved and pitch dark. Falcon felt stifled. He wanted to get out. Presently, the light grew. Two ribbons of track appeared ahead in the gloom. Watch the track! Watch the track! warned Duke. Fusspot! Fusspot! scoffed Falcon. The tunnel mouth grew larger and larger till at last they burst into the sunshine. The line swung sharply right here. It was laid on a ledge cut in the hillside. Below lie the valley up which they had just come. Track and buildings looked tiny, like toys. No one quite knows what happened next. Duke says there must have been something on the track, and Falcon hadn't kept a good lookout. Falcon said he was dazzled, so how could he keep a good lookout? Anyway, their coaches had barely cleared the tunnel when Falcon lurched. His front wheels, derailed, crunched over sleepers and ballast. He came to rest with one wheel uncomfortably near the edge. Duke had saved Falcon. Now he held on grimly with locked wheels and taut couplings. You idiot! he hissed. Stop it! I can't hold you if you shake! Falcon tried hard to stop shuddering. Quickly, Duke's driver and fireman chocked his wheels and strengthened the coupling between the two engines. Thank you, said Duke. Now I'll manage. With Duke secure, the two crews, helped by a plate layer, propped up Falcon's front end. They were looking forward to a rest when Duke began wheeshing in an alarming way. His fireman ran into his cab. Water! he cried. We want water! Quickly! The plate layer's cottage stood nearby. He explained to his wife, and the passengers borrowed jugs, buckets, kettles, saucepans, anything in fact which could hold water. They formed a chain from the well to the engine, and passed them from hand to hand. The fireman, meanwhile, reduced his fire and anxiously watched the gauge. It was hot and tiring work, for Duke needed many gallons, but at last the fireman shouted cheerfully, We're winning! Don't weaken! And they all set to work again with a will. They cheered again when the breakdown gang arrived. They showed the other passengers how to help them leave a falcon back onto the rails. The manager was at the top station. He said he was sorry about the accident and thanked the passengers for their help. Well, not at all, they said. We admired the way you put things right and enjoyed the adventure. They thanked Duke and his crew for preventing a nasty accident. Your Duke, they said, is a hero. He stood firm like a bulldog and just wouldn't let go. Falcon said, Thank you, too. I don't know why you bothered after I'd been so rude. No, oh, well, replied Duke. You'd just had a new coat of paint. It would have been a pity if you'd rolled down the mountain and spoilt it. That would never have suited his grace. I hope you have enjoyed this collection of stories, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so, so much for persisting with episode 8 of the Speedy Stuff podcast. In episode 9, which will be uploaded a fortnight today, which will be, what, the 1st of December, I believe, we will be continuing these stories with episode 9, and incidentally, we will also in turn be starting with the second half of volume 25 of the Railway series. So once again, thank you all very, very much for watching, and on behalf of both Mach 5 Productions and Terrier Productions, this has been Lewis of the Speedy Stuff Podcast, saying thank you all very, very much for listening. 
See you in the next episode. And we also apologise for wasting your time. That's an important one as well. <laughs>